global countries and the multiple countries, they produce the components that. It was in the boundaries of the icon. I can, yes. Yeah. So don't think about that. Yeah. Nice color. Enjoy. <laughs> 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 get sexual health and um, the concern at that, mo at that time and I think still very much so was around eight. A lot of young people are coming online <laughs> etc and as we know people young old regardless of age gender sexuality ability etc use the internet for sexual expression and by sexual expression I do not mean only pornography right individuals use the internet to explore their sexuality to go on dates to find you know online dating build relationships find romance have sex sexting get sexual health information all sorts of things there's a wide range of things and however despite this being pretty much ubiquitous sexual expression is still seen as the illegitimate child of the free expression movement. We tend to think of legitimate expression that is worth protecting or free expression as that which is political or religious. But we rarely put sexual expression in the same basket in free of free expression as something that needs to be upheld and protected in the same way as other forms of expression. Sexuality has always been instrumentalized as a way to regulate behavior and citizenship. So, for example, through marriage, through divorce, um, through religion, and through criminalization of particular forms of sexual subjectivities. So for people who face discrimination because of their sexuality, so for example, whether sex workers, whether LGBT persons, or women who want to make autonomous choices about their sexual bodies, um, they really need a, a space um, that is that where they are able to have accurate, unbiased information about sexuality and sexual health. And this space is really critical so that because it affects their right to life, it, it affects their right to health. Um, and to be able to have a space where they can find community, get support and form relationships because this again affects the right to associate and the right to family life. And this is at the heart of it, the right to expression. And this is why this is a very important conversation to have in this space. In, the, in India, in the last four or five years, we've had a number of cases of what are called rape videos. By a rape video, I do not mean what is called rape pornography online, right? Where porn sites have enacted rape porn, or what I refer to as the consensual performance of a non-consensual act. That is a different thing. When I talk about rape videos, what I'm talking about is a situation where gangs of men accost girls or women who they meet offline in physical spaces, in villages, in small towns, in big cities. They rape them. They then take videos of the rape itself, and these are then distributed. Sometimes they're uh, sold. They circulate very, very widely on WhatsApp, which is the biggest social media platform used in India, and Facebook, etc. And the Supreme Court of India has just sent a notice to Facebook, Twitter, Yahoo, and a bunch of other social media platforms asking what these intermediaries or platforms intend to do about this kind of non-consensual pornographic content that is online. Okay, so the, this is clearly a crime. Rape is a crime against consent. Filming a rape is a second crime against consent, and distributing is a t it is a third crime against consent. We cannot even imagine that this can be called consensual sexual expression. Thank you. I, I fully agree, and I think there is a big discussion about the role of, of these uh, platforms in relation with uh, uploading content. And I think that if it's a crime, it should be punished. And um, I'm not sure if I agree that anonymity is always the best, uh, and uh, if it's a crime, they should find a way 
to know who or from where this this crime was committed. And and I think that that you made a, a very interesting point. Every time that these crimes are committed, the focus is oh she had a very strange clothing, oh she was young and provoking, and nobody is focusing on the real crime, and which is extremely uh, extremely um, disturbing. And I think it's it sh we should be we should be more more strong about being this message to our lawmakers and, and regulators. But I think the deeper issue is that, honestly, we have a deep crisis of consent online. We don't have an ethics of consent. We see it in everything from people who just take somebody's photo, use it even in a non-sexual way, who you know take someone's email address, make it public, or someone's information. So part of that responsibility is also has to come from us as users. I mean, who is the internet ultimately? It's us, yeah. So when, you, when you're teaching, you can't assume, you can't tell, especially the youngsters, not to sex because it's, become, it's becoming an increasingly um, la largely used platform for sexual exploration and expression. So all you can do is to actually teach them, teach people how to be safe when they're doing this. And there are a whole bunch of uh, resources available for this. Coding Rights issued, um, has brought out this pamphlet, like I think l last IGF, they got out a pamphlet which uh, it's called like Send, Send Safer Nudes. It has, uh, you know, it, it, it suggests apps to you which you can use to blur out your face. It suggests uh, what cameras you can, what camera apps you can use. It, it shows you how to change your metadata on the camera apps. You know, so that, you know, the, the person who wants to abuse your images will find it much, much harder to do so. And I think that's the way to go, really. I think the relationship between the role of the state as um, the key body that is, as it were, the backstop responsibility for child rights, and then the question of parents and parents' responsibilities in relation to ensuring child rights. And some of the tensions that we see are about the um, uh, responsibilities of state versus parents. Human rights um, debates, including at the Internet Governance Forum, where people are talking about the right to expression, to privacy, to dignity, and so forth, not always remembering that children are included within those frameworks as well. So a rights framework puts children into that wider um, context and reminds us that while protection is key, children in their own right have the right to freedom of expression, privacy, dignity, non-discrimination, um, and so forth. Parents need to learn, but also they need to be supported by industry when they use these devices in their household where the children are uh, also there. So my, the organization I'm working for has also done some, some research into the, what we call safety by design. This would be a solution to address two aspects. The one thing is that from the beginning of considering to produce a product or to develop a service, it should be taken into consideration what usage of that product would mean by children. Would that put children at a specific risk and then to consider how this risk, risk could be addressed? So the children were not a target of advertisement in the old days. Uh, the, the youth became a target around the 80s, actually. At that point, when the wells started coming, uh, the big companies found out that to target the youth would actually be really helpful because they have a lot of money. If they don't have the money, the parents will have the money. So that's when they started to seduce the youth and try to target them. So um, we have to understand that to collect the data from children is gold for the people who collect this data because they can market not only now when they're young like a baby, but for the rest of their lives. And now we're here in 2016, if I would tell my grandmother what we could do now, she would be flabbergasted. And we ain't seen nothing yet, because the Internet of Things and the Internet of Toys will bring us a world we just cannot imagine what will be possible. It will go so enormously fast, it's even for us, geeks being here, hard to, to, to keep up. So how can parents keep up with all these things that's go that are going on? And, and also we have parents, and I'm one so I can say this, who are, are very busy in their lives. And we all know that feeling that sometimes it's very convenient to give the kid the iPad 
so at least you have some moments of rest, so you can do the cooking or the last emails you still needed to do um, to, in order to go on with your life. The second is defining the problem. Country, Muslim women in my country, and I believe in many parts of the world as well, um, they face additional risks for being, one, a woman, and second, uh, Muslim. Uh, so abuse, harassment, violence against women is a cultural constant, right? Um, and the interpretations of Islam has been used to justify um, acts like beatings of wives, marital rapes, or treating women as a secondary uh, citizens. Um, and this is even down to things like, you know, as simple as what to wear and who you can, um, who you should meet. Uh, so Muslim women, they really have no choice but to uh, move to the online space where they can actually explore their identities and also to understand the interpretations of Quran um, in terms of gender relations and, um, and the normative hierarchies of powers in society. Um, but the sad thing is, um, we are seeing abuse and harassment um, on this space as well. Um, and the other concern that we are seeing is also um, social surveillance. As women, um, the moment we step off of the house, um, we, are, we are under scrutiny um, you know, for how we behave and what we wear as well. Um, and over the years, social media has become this um, space of hyper visibilities. So everything you do is no longer private. Um, and this affects even those who do not intentionally seek to be uh, visible online. So for instance, there are dedicated websites um, or social media contents to mock, insult um, so-called non-compliant Muslim women, uh, like, you know, like women who are not wearing headscarf or single women in their mid-30s or 40s or even videos of women for merely speaking loudly in the public space, uh, or trans women. Um, so this sort of visibility is it's undesirable. These women never ask for it. But this also comes with harassment, stalking, um, threats, lots of job opportunity, uh, mobilities, um, and they face constant public humiliations, emotional, and sometimes physical violence as well. Um, what is ironic is that they are visible online, but in a way, it makes them invisible in the physical space. Um, and so that's why it's so exciting to see this type of design thinking workshop with such a diverse community. So, and the other part was, it's very important to have governmental and technical solutions, but that can't happen on their own. Because if it's done without consulting the people who are affected, <laughs> then they won't be good technical solutions. And we all know about those really bad solutions that in fact are perhaps surveillance mechanisms for us as women out on the street that are meant to protect us, right? So I think it's really exciting to have this model. The other thing that came out very strongly in that report was the importance to look at not over-legislating or definitely not just looking at criminalization as a solution. And in fact, it won't be necessarily a good solution if you, what women need is something else. And so that's another thing that I think the process that has been introduced by Saad will help us to get at. We know that legislation would take a really long time and we know about the impunity in so many countries. So what other options do we have? What kind of support is out there for the people that we're really worried about um, that, you know, or we're seeing what's happening and we want to know what we can do to help. Um, okay, so one, in fact, the Advocate General, whose recommendations the CJEU more one aspect of conflict between free expression and privacy and the right to be forgotten is simply the question of 
what content should the law require intermediaries to take down? That's a really interesting question, and we're not talking about it. Or we'll talk about it a little bit, but the, the main point we want to get to here isn't that substantive question about ba balancing privacy and free expression. It's the procedural fairness question about how intermediaries, these private platforms, should decide whether there should be um, processes for the accused speakers to be able to defend their speech, how appeals should work, you know, how you can have a notice and takedown system predicated in data protection law. <clears throat> right to forgotten is not uh, very uh, welcomed in Asia uh, for a reason. Uh, there are many countries uh, formerly colonized by Europe uh, and as a fallout from colonization, they suffer dictatorships as well, until recently. Um, and these formal colonies and formal dictatorships, uh, they have not resolved these uh, uh, structural injustices or structural oppression that uh, still remain in their societies. And you know, in, in addressing those structures, uh, they need to see the whole truth uh, for full uh, resolution. I mean, not partial truth, not truth just about public figures, not truth only about you know high-level officials who collaborate with the uh, dictatorships or colonial administrations. I mean, Google is processing like one million requests a year, but you know Google doesn't want to do it. They are doing it only because they are forced to do it. If somebody submits a right to forgotten request and Google does not comply. Uh, he or she can submit the request again to Data Protection Authority and now Data Protection can you know, force uh, Google to uh, uh, delist. So it's not really privatized. Instead of being the judges or competent authorities who rule on each of these specific cases, this great responsibility has been given to search engines themselves, to private companies, who must not only decide which information must be eliminated, but also consider public interest issues when making such a decision. So what happened? What, what are the issues with this ruling? First of all, broad and vague terms like inadequate, irrelevant, out of date, or excessive. It allows the removal of legal versus illegal information. A private entity makes the decision, not a judge, and it does not set forth enough safe words for public interest. To be honest here, I mean, the right to be forgotten is really, really challenging for not only for Google, for, but for a whole host of internet companies. It goes at the very, very core to discussions about the openness of the internet. Uh, it talks about social, cultural, historical, political, uh, the technical features of internet governance. So this is a good place to discuss these issues, but it is extremely difficult. Uh, for companies to uh, adhere to because it's just extremely tricky to sort of nail down even the whole term right to be forgotten is wrong. So um, the first thing we need to separate and I think there is a different procedure uh, for you balancing freedom of expression and privacy rights and then there should be maybe different uh, techniques for balancing data protection and, and, and freedom of expression as well. There are lots of debates on the freedom of expression expression field, especially when related to the uh, journalists and the ability of journalists to seek for information and to spread information because not all the time you can assert clearly that something is truth. Uh, so this is already problematic when you have a court deciding and would be even more problematic if you transfer this responsibility to uh, administrative agencies or even to the private company that the, the is responsible for the search. We should also consider on separating or trying to uh, craft balanced rules between uh, freedom of expression and data protection. We should think differently about when the consumer has a specific rela relation with a platform and then this right to remove content from that platform which should not require a court order, of course. You could just reach out to the company and say, all this data that I give to you, uh, if there is a data protection rule that allows me to delete it, you should delete it with no delay uh, from companies that are uh, tagging or indexing, uh, especially the search engines, uh, content that was not uploaded by the user itself.